so we came to the point of definition of harmonic measure last time. Um, and uh, the conclusion is that for, you know, in all this generality of possibly mixed for dimension and possibly more general measures than how to measure the boundary and more general, you know, weights measures inside the domain, um, just model of one gross condition that I've showed you before. We can, in principle, define the solutions, hence we can define harmonic measure by the representation formula. <laughs> and it will satisfy the usual, um, you know, comparison principle, change of poles, and things like this. Um, I'm not going to go over the details of this, either you sort of know it by heart, or it's um, not worth this exercise right now, but the point is, what you expect a solution that I'm going to satisfy, in terms of Dublin, in terms of the generates, in terms of connection to the green function, you always can um, in this super general context. And in particular, you can uh, pass from one hole to another in a certain uniform scale and variant way, which will come handy very soon because remember that harmonic matter is really expression of point X. So secretly, it's a collection of matter. Um, corresponding to different points on the set, and what's important is that it can go from one point to another degree, basically, due to the comparison principle. What's also important and what we will be using is that harmonic measure is related to the green function um, by the um, usual formulas in this context, and um, you know, this, this will be used throughout the conversation. Um, and perhaps a uh, uh, more customary way to start talking about the harmonic measure now business is starting from our speeches right now, <laughs> which we are all embarrassingly using. Um, and uh, this is a, a probabilistic interpretation. So the harmonic measure would, would also be interpreted as a, if you are talking about the measure of a subset E of the boundary, um, which you can see over here, for example. You can also interpret it as a probability that a Brownian traveler starting from point X um, will exit through E rather than the rest of the domain. I actually don't know, is this picture a real Brownian traveler? Or it's a- The top one is by X, but the bottom one is closer. Yeah, because the top one seems to be like a very determined Brownian traveler. <laughs> <laughs> they typically more. Um, working around, but either way, so you can also think about the probabilistic definition, which uh, I sort of will keep emphasizing despite the fact that the donor is not the way to prove sense, but it's a very intuitive way to think about this. So you send a brand new traveler and you look at this. Um, if you have never uh, seen this, uh, there is a very nice way to see that the uh, Brownian notion is actually harmonic, at least in the screen, is that. Um, since you have, so imagine you are on the lattice and um, let me maybe try to add the picture page. So let's say you are on the lattice and um, well, you know what the lattice looks like. Um, so if you are brown, you're a traveler, your probability to go up, down, left and right is exactly the same. So from example, from this point to go here, here, here and here, it's exactly the same probability. Which means that uh, your facts, let's say this is point, um, let's say your facts uh, y would be exactly one quarter of um, u of x plus one y plus u of x minus one y plus u of x y plus one plus u of x y minus one because it's a Brownian traveler, because it's exactly one quarter. And then what it means is that um, you can rewrite the equation as saying that, um, let's see, can I do it um, being half asleep? So it means that you of uh, so basically what I'm trying to say is that if you think about the second derivatives interpreted in the discrete sense, this is exactly what you are getting because you will get u of x plus one, <laughs> y plus u of x minus one y minus two u of x y divided by let's say two 
I mean, division is fake, of course, here because the right hand side is zero. Plus the same for y, x, y minus one, and so on, equals zero, which will, of course, give you the second derivative in x of u plus the second derivative in y of u equal to zero. Okay, so this is sort of a very marking way to show this. But the point is that uh, some variation property actually tells you that. Um, the Brownian trouble is harmonic, and secretly it's a good exercise to have done once in your life because one day when you are defining the Laplacian in much more general scenarios like in graphs and things like this, it's actually a sub liberation that you are using. It's a very useful way to actually define the Laplacian in various funky situations. But either way, um, we also have defined, I mean, so this is a probability simplification, but we also have defined a uh, couple of slides ago the harmonic measure uh, by connections with uh, the Dirichlet problem as a measure given the representation of the solutions. And so it's basically, you know, the main tool, one of the main tools to study the Dirichlet problem because it gives you, it recovers the solution for every data. So if you have a flash on you inside the domain with data from the boundary, you can recover the solution as an integral of that against the harmonic measure. The problem is that it would be good to know something about harmonic measure in order to use this. I mean, it's a nice representation formula, but it doesn't give you much. And the properties I showed you on the previous slide are kind of free, but simultaneously not super strong. They don't actually tell you much about um, the measure itself. And the main questions in this context are uh, well, the first main questions are the mention of the structure of the support of omega. In other words, what the Brownian travelers actually see. Um, in principle, uh, you know, you could say that on the pictures you know, from the previous slide, it's quite obvious because the harmonic measure is roughly proportional to the back size of the corresponding part of the boundary. But the boundary would be much less accessible than that. If it looks kind of round ish. Of course, you know, when, wherever you start from, you're going to have decent access. And so your probability to hit a piece of the boundary is more or less just dependent on the size. If you have something more complicated, this is actually a real picture from um, one of the collaborators. So uh, it's um, a molecular network. I mean, that actually this is about semiconductors. But the point is that and this is actually in our three, but even think about this is dimensional one. Um, it's not clear at all that the Brownian traveler starting from down, starting from up, you name it, is going to have a probability proportional to the, the back size of the boundary to actually hit it. It might get lost in the fjords. It might never get there. It might get there, but nowhere proportionally to the size. So, what can happen is, first of all, if your Brownian traveler is facing a fractal, and this is not really a fractal, but imagine you know you keep making this antenna smaller and smaller. Does it even ever get there? So does it actually have, is it going to access all of the fractal boundary? And secondly, even you know, even if the boundary is n minus one dimensional. Is the probability proportional to its size? Because I mean, it's pretty obvious that the probability of hitting this point from coming from down is much bigger than the probability of hitting this point coming from down. And uh, this is what's called um, well, the first one is about the dimension, the second one is about absolute continuity. And the way we are going to talk about absolute continuity, and of course, you know, the definition is the one you know if uh, you have a Set um, even by the value of zero, it implies that the measure in question is zero. But the way we actually want to think about this is the quantitative notion, the so called A infinity condition. And one of the ways to define it, I mean, there is sort of a more proper way in more general sets, but the one I want you to retain is what you see here, which basically means that uh, this is a sigma, so this is volume in the back sense. So basically, it means that when you measure is kind of the power of, of the Lebesgue measure of the set in this scale invariant way. And in other words, I mean, your Brownian traveler C portions of the boundary kind of comparatively to the Lebesgue size. 
So again, the question of dimension of sport is basically what I'm basically done at all. The question of infinity is more whether it's actually proportional to the, to the corresponding on the back side. Like, seeing that you're flying from the dorsal plan uh, towards the tree, and the question is, you know, one was if they hit all branches, and two was if the probability to hit all branches actually has anything to do with the size of the branch, they are shielded by leaves and the terminals and shifts. That's more or less the idea. Um, so I do want to uh, mention a couple of things about this. Uh, first of all, I mean, absolute continuity of course not a semantic notion by itself, but in the context of infinity condition and things like this, there is a beauty period in which it is symmetric. If you have omega infinity with respect to sigma, the opposite is also true. This is magical and this is super strong. It's sort of a real analytic magical fact. But it's very convenient because it means that you get to use maximum statistics and things like this and prove things that you wouldn't sometimes be able to prove hands on otherwise. Um, and second point about the absolute mutual absolute continuity is that it doesn't really matter from which point in the part because working inside of the main street. So while in principle I retain the pole for scale and variant estimate, it doesn't really matter all that much. Okay, um, another point that I would like to make, because it will be um, very useful to talk about this things, and this is sort of a max that um, already defined yesterday, or at least mentioned yesterday, is that if you have infinity with your harmonic measures, qualitatively absolutely continuous with respect to sigma, then you can define a non-linear derivative, which we are referring to as post and channel. Hi. And uh, the beauty of it is that A infinity condition is equivalent to the so-called reverse order condition. Uh, I'm not sure. Small. If you get the complaint, I'm not sure. <laughs> not a big. But I do think that we should have gotten the sound from the yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> and yesterday. Yesterday we will do. Dan is not allowed to complain. <laughs> I'll try to move closer to that. I think that's the problem. I should. I can switch the sound to this one. The problem is that. If... No, no, I need my iPad. No, I mean, you need to stop. Uh, mute. I can mute you. Yeah. I can mute my iPad. But otherwise, we'll have good feedback. Um. Turn the sound off. Isn't it? It's muted, it's muted I think. Not, not the microphone. Everything that's possibly can be muted is muted. <laughs> yes, that's. So then, so see that the problem is that the sound doesn't go to zero. Uh huh. So if I turn this microphone on, we'll get feedback. I strongly suggest to figure it out. In the end of the structure, not okay. in the middle of it. Yeah, so then can you unmute the microphone, the iPad? Um, it is unmuted. Okay. I, I suspect it's because I'm walking, but I actually need to walk now to fall. Um, I'll try, Polina. <laughs> Um, okay, so back to the story. Infinity condition is actually um, equivalent. Can I get this uh, beautiful scene off somehow so that it doesn't cover part of the picture? No? Okay, too bad. Um, so, infinity is equivalent to the order. Uh, which is a useful thing to use and mention, maybe, if we manage. That's not gonna help, it's up and not sideways. Um, too bad. It was good five seconds ago, so it shouldn't have mastered. Um, but basically, yes, it says that post and kernel is in some uniform. 
I also want to mention, and this is also something that I think that Max mentioned yesterday, that in the non scenarios when we actually have a normal derivative, the Poisson kernel is a normal derivative of the green function. And because it's fun to integrate by parts in the morning, let's integrate by parts to see it. So to me, it's easiest to see it from representation formulas. I mean, you are solving um, Laplace u equals zero with u on the boundary given by some function f. So on one hand, you have u equal to, as we just discussed, integral on the boundary of f times d omega, which is the same as by definition f times the Poisson kernel d sigma y. Again, assuming that everything is good. And on the other hand, by a uh, green function representation, and I'm short of mass up science, but you have integral on omega of, let's see, Laplacian g of x, y, uh, u of y, dy, uh, plus the same thing the other way around, right? Um, g of x, y, Laplacian u of y, dy equal to uh, integral on the boundary of normal derivative. Again, I'll probably mess up signs, but that's details. G, X, Y, U of Y, dy. And same piece, integral on the boundary, G, D, nu, Y, of U, dy. Now, this is... Um, zero because u is zero, uh, plus one of u is zero, it's a harmonic function. This is delta function by definition of the green function. And so this entire thing is u of x, this thing is u of x. And the um, green function is zero on the boundary, so this is zero as well. And so all you have left is u of x being equal to this. And when you, and of course, u is f on the boundary. So this is secretly f. And so if you compare this formula to uh, the other formula, meaning this equal to u and this equal to the same u, you observe that the constant kernel is the normal derivative of the grid function. I mean, you need to prove uniqueness and stuff, but this isn't totally what's happening. So it's a good to it's good to be thinking about this, but um, once again, you know, it's only if normal derivative is defined and things like this are good. But let's talk back about the um, dimension of the harmonic measure. I'm not going to be proving much about it, but I'll mention that you know, in the spirit of many people who have tried to give you problems, you problems. problems. Uh, so the only circumstances in which it's known is dimension proof. And basically, uh, just to work, I mean, I would attribute it to Makarov, even though, you know, there are some stronger and greater results by John and Wolf, we have all of them. But long story short, the dimension of harmonic measure in R2 is exactly one. So even if you have a two dimension, you know, a fractal, which is more of dimension one, like that's Cox snowflake I started from yesterday, your Brownian travelers are not going to see it. They will choose a subset of dimension one in a rather mysterious way and land on it. So you have this Fox snowflake. You have, I mean, I don't want to redraw it. Um, you probably can go all the way back to it. Uh, there. You have the Fox snowflake, so you will have your Brownian travelers know, entering from up or down, but never moving into the chaos of reality, so they will choose the subset of dimension one and land on it, rather mysteriously. What's even more mysterious about this business is that your assumption, probably a natural assumption, that this is the case in hard dimension as well, is actually wrong, meaning that the dimension of harmonic measure in if n is bigger than two, is not necessarily n minus one. And in particular, there is a counter example to the book that shows that there is a set of um, dimensions, three higher than n minus one, three higher than two in R3. 
which hosts the harmonic measure. Um, it's pretty amazing that this is actually sort of a real life phenomenon, meaning that not only it exists as a nice curiosity, but it's used in real life. I mean, um, in particular, so this is a example due to um, some of my collaborators, and uh, it has been used to build the noise abatement poles. So sound is harmonic. It's acoustic waves, and you can get acoustic waves lost in your fractals, and then the noise doesn't come from one side of the road to the other side of the road. And this is really built for the rules of way of that kind of reading it. If you need to justify our existence to some funding agencies, I shouldn't be saying that for the channel. But it's not. It's not. It's still the most efficient acoustic world known in the world, and um, it's, it's really that. But long story short, somewhere between two and three, there is a number given the dimension of harmonic measure, and we still don't know what this number is. So there are results due to Burgain, a result due to Burgain, which says that the dimension is strictly less than M, strictly less than the M dimension. It sounds like a very pitiful result, which is given so. Um, it's the best possible. So uh, the dimension of harmonic measure, the harmonic measure is supported on the side of the dimension less than none, but that's actually all we have. And that it's possible to be the different dimension than that. And there are some mysterious conversations <laughs> with different conjectures as to what it should be, but in reality, they actually don't know. In particular, there is a rather nice write up by Peter Jones um, speaking about some scaling arguments for why it should be well at least in dimension two i think he's claiming in dimension three i think he's claiming on uh, the top um i also know people who doubt it very much saying that it's really difficult to build anything like this and already from snowflake is likely to minus seven i mean two plus two to minus seven so it's a very very big time even though above two dimensions but even if, um, all right, even if we know that the set of the half of dimension is minus one, do we know that the harmonic measure is absolutely continuous with respect to sigma? Do we know that it's actually supported? Um, e even if it's on the full set, do we know that the primary travelers see portion of the set proportionally to its Lebesgue size? The answer is no. It highly depends on the geometry and um, on the operator at hand. And this is actually sort of the core of this course. At which point we are switching from beautiful slides to an ugly handwriting, but it is what it is. So there we go. And tell me if, you know, I was writing it to myself, something that I'm going to do the blackboard. I think that's just what I thought. So if there are abbreviations of just kind of writing that we don't understand that, you know, or if it's just too small. Anyway, in order to talk about the AMP problem, so we have to talk about the closeness of the Dirichlet problem. But we have already discussed that the harmonic measure arises so that the reproducing kernel in the sense of the Dirichlet or reproducing measure of the solution to the Dirichlet problem. But what does it really mean about the solution? You know, we are speaking of the problem, we want estimates in the solution, we want to know that for every data there is a solution. That's what harmonic measure assures for you, that you can reproduce the solution. But then the question is, in which space, you know, what, what are the estimates? In which sense, small as of what are the appropriate estimates? And better yet, what are the appropriate estimates going to mean the infinity and so continuity of the harmonic measure? So to talk about those things, we need a few notions which are going to be prevalent through this talk, uh, through this lecture, so together. Um, so one is the non-conjectural maximal function. Uh, let's say, you know, for simplicity in half space or above a graph, you take a non-conjectural cone, you can see it on the picture, cone looks like a cone. So in half space, you would have this thing. And non-tangential maximal function is the supremum of u of the solution u on the cone. 
So at every point, you take cone, you take supremum on the cone, and this is your non tangential maximal function. Um, the reason for a slightly funky writing here is that the way we are defining these non tangential approach regions on the bright side is available for every domain. You can always define it by this property and trust me, it's a cone. Um, y minus x less than um, some aperture time distance from y to the boundary. So this is a definition by whatever your boundary is. It doesn't look completely like a cone anymore. That's why, you know, the funky writing, and if you have to retrace what it is, you have to stay positive distance from the boundary, but it's not exactly those straight lines. It doesn't matter too much, however. So think of it as a cone. Another notion which is super useful is the square function, which is an integral over the same cone of gradius squared dx divided by delta of x distance to the boundary. Delta is the distance, Euclidean distance to the boundary, to the power n minus one to one half. So the way I uh, want you to be thinking about this, and again, I'll be repeating this over and over again, is uh, what's dimensionless here and how do we want to measure it? So remember that due to Kachopalo of regularity of harmonic functions, whatever way you want to think about this, you're selling derivatives for powers of the distance to the boundary. So if you want, if the harmonic function is bounded, for example, on a ball, what's also bounded is a two norm or you know any norm or just point wise. Uh, delta times the gradient So this is the way or radius of the ball times the gradient This is just the way in scale. I mean, like saying it's, you know, regulating of solutions to PDs is like Taylor formula for factors. Basically, it's, you know, it, it does what you think the smooth function should do, except that it does it perfectly at all scales and the appropriate way of sets. So what's dimensionless here is delta times gradient of your facts meaning that this behaves, this should be the same, which is good and bounded. Um, and of course you have your cone of dimension N. So if you're integrating against Delta divided by um, distance to the power N, this is sort of exactly hidden in the correct dimension. And just as you have the stars and measures since you're dividing by distance to the power N, you need the core to behave a little bit better than just a constant. So basically what happens is that you are sort of making sure the square function is, you know, well behaved, LP of something like this, if the oscillation sort of calm down towards the boundary. So what's happening is that the gradient of the oscillations of the solutions, and what you are making sure is again, that you can sort of integrate against the exact correct power of distance to the boundary, so that the oscillations come down tiny little bit. Not too much, but they're becoming better, they're integrated. And the same happens with Carlison measures. So, I mean, um, you might remember, hopefully remember from yesterday, the Carlison measure definition. Again, it's a measure which is sort of n plus one dimensional, which behaves like an n-dimensional one. So you are integrating it on the integral ball, but it behaves like sigma uniformly. But what you are going to keep integrating over and over and over again, whether it's about geometry, it's about coefficients, or it's about solutions, what you are going to keep integrating is something with once again, sort of against one over T or one over delta or one over you know R, whatever way you want to think about this. So it's this dimensionless quantity times something that you know would normally prevent you from being able to integrate exactly, exactly on the Order of it. And once again, what it assures is that your gradients, you know, come down tiny little bit as you have the boundary. So I, you know, I will only give some proofs, of course, and not many of them, but this is the way I want you to be thinking about this. You can control square functions, you can control conversion matrix, you can control all of these notions if the oscillations of your solutions come, you know, that tiny little bit better in the sense of being integrated. And this is the recurrent thing which made this entire thing possible is that the solution is never perfect. You always have a point where it's singular. Near the corner, it's always singular. 
the geometry is never perfect. If you have corners, you know, you can do nothing about it. But somehow this correlates and measure notion, which is prevalent in rectifiability, prevalent in estimates of the solution, prevalent over and over again, is what lets you say that things are good most of the time. Not everywhere, but most of the time. And this is somehow the correct way to think about this. This is why, you know, C alpha or C1 or something like this would never give you even on the and this thing actually does. Mm -hmm. It lets you ignore small details. And this is what's relevant, for example, in physics too. And I mean, that's why, you know, this is an appropriate thing to talk about both rectifiability and this kind of estimate of the solutions, because you shouldn't care about the small defects. Any material will have small defects. It shouldn't upset the um, physical phenomena too much, unless there are too many of them. And this exactly gives you an idea of what too many or not too many actually means. So things which are scarce, and you know there are few of them as you come to the boundary. Sort of if your material becomes you know relatively uniform, relatively smooth, if you come to the boundary, things are generally working out okay, even if there are point defects, which there will always be. Okay. And one thing, you know, mathematically, which we are going to be using over and over again is the so-called Carlson inequality, which is basically duality between the non-tangential maximum function and Carlson measure. So what it says is that if you have a, I mean, this is in half space, but it also can be done in much more general scenarios, is that if you have um, an integral of f against d mu, it's bounded by the non-tangential max of f in L1 times mu and Carlson measures. And typically, we will normally be using it in L2. So actually, the non-tangential max in L2 times Carlos and Nagel of sort of mu squared, I feel, which, you know, whatever fits me in Carlos. And this is super useful, and this will be used over and over again. And the sort of duality, but because it's about measures, you cannot really say that. All of these notions can be generalized to the more general context that I've been talking about. Um, I will let you just trust me that they can. I mean, I'll sort of quickly walk, but um, in this mixed um, mixed dimensional Dublin measure anyway inside kind of row, all of this can be defined. You just have to weigh things appropriately. So square function can be defined. Um, you can see the definition over here. So you have to weigh by this measure inside the domain um measure m inside the domain non-tangential max is obviously exactly the same it's problem on the phone it's problem on the phone no matter what you do it's not about the weights in square function you integrate so you have to integrate against the correct um weight inside um here is a small check that i didn't cheat and but you'll probably trust me that i can uh do the measures um uh, in the back case correctly uh, you can define more generally Carlos and measure the solutions. Once again, the scale and remember the scale and factor row that we try to control all this time, which is the relationship between the measure inside and measure on the boundary. Um, and with this scale and factor, I mean, which will be sitting over here, you can define the Carlos and measure all the same. So. You know, again, I mean, this is just, you know, a natural, I mean, once you think that this is a principle possible, it's a natural generalization um, given the generality of sets and measures. And the point is that, uh, so we say that the Dirichlet problem DP is solvable if we have, you know, tangential maximal function in LP, that is for every data F in LP, there is a solution and the solution satisfies non-tangential maximal function estimate by F in LP. This is double poseness. In principle, notice that formally this is sort of an extension of the maximum principle in the sense that P equal infinity would give you a maximum principle, formally speaking, because you non tangential max is supremum on the phone. And if you take supremum of the phone and everything you know, here, this is the maximum of U, which is bounded by an infinity normal path, which is the maximum of F. But as a matter of fact, the more appropriate endpoint estimate is the so called BMO one. And it gives you the Carlson measure estimate by F 
in game mode. We will not be using it super much, so I won't go into details of that, but just you know, for the record, that's what I should mm -hmm. But well, poisonous is this thing. And now one of the um, most useful pieces of sort of um, hard analysis in this business, which we will be using over and over again, is the fact that A infinity property of harmonic measure is equivalent to the solvability of Dirichlet problem in LP, that to the fact that there exists a P in which Dirichlet problem is solvable, equivalent to the fact that bounded solutions satisfy Parmesan measure estimates, equivalent to the fact that the square function is bounded by the non tangential maximum function for OP or for one Q. We'll talk about this, but this is actually all equivalent. Equivalent to the fact that it became more solid. So you can be proven either of this. And all of this is true in the full generality of you know, this mixed with dimensional size, super general measure sense like that. The only thing I want to mention is that um, the Harnam chains in port condition, which I'm feeling so is important here, because the equivalent between um, harmonic measure and some other properties is not quite there if you don't have access, if you don't have the torch. But since I'm ignoring this detail here, just you know, all our sets, let's say, non potentially accessible. So in principle, you you have access. And hence you have this full equivalence. And this is how we are going to be approaching it. Is there a version that's done with uh, Omega and weak amp and without full harnack fields? I'm trying to think. I'm sure there are other options. But you're but, saying maybe it's open still. But not in this generality okay. for sure. Yeah. I mean it's a long, you know, I um I have this embarrassing incomplete list of references because honestly this is just off the top of my head what I remember and I found it by the time I post it online and I should be going to figure out the details. To me the it really goes to any co five all of this. They did it in half space but I think that's what actually started this and you know what we all have been extended. Uh, there is a slightly uh, better, sharper version with Kenny Kirchheim Piper Tora. Uh, then, before we did it for general ADR set with different pieces of it, then we did it together for D dimensional, lower dimensional ADR sets. And the one I'm quoting today in this mix for dimensional context is actually Kao and Yabuta. It's uh, on archive. I can tell you honestly, I didn't check it, but I certainly believe it. I mean, like it. Logical that it's actually going to generate. So, this mixed point dimensional business we haven't made use, but we did like the basic elliptic theory, all of them say mm -hmm. Dublin and definition of harmonic measure and stuff like this. We didn't go here, this is not our talk, but again, it looks natural. So, I would, I would more or less believe that this is true. And there are also, yeah, so maybe this goes to your question. So, there is something that's the best to condition by. Chairman company. Um, I'm not sure that asks for property that doesn't ask for Carnac chain. So Samsung is so, so yeah, they they have it. But it's in quite dimensional one. But in higher ones, you just have Carnac chains anyway. Um I'm not going to give you proofs of any of this because I want to get the proofs of other things, but I do want to mention two things. So first of all, why infinity has to do with LP will cause a directly problem in principle. Well, because of reverse filter, morally speaking. Because if you're, um, I mean, this is one direction and very handful even, but you know, since a infinity is actually equivalent to the fact that um, Poisson kernel is reverse holder. When you are writing the representation, remember you are integrating against the Poisson kernel. So reverse holder BQ means you know LQ with appropriate scale invariant estimates. So what it means is that you get to integrate against LQ. So it means that you get to draw the data from LQ prime. So morally speaking, it means you get to solve with LQ prime data. Because again, if you have K is an OQ, you get K average with an function, and that's why you can solve the direct problem. 
the reality is, of course, slightly harder than that. I mean, honestly, not too much harder. Uh, one thing to keep in mind is that have no, um, non potential max is you know, one of the maximal functions. It's sort of the appropriate generalization of how little with maximal function to um, solutions. And in particular, you can see pretty directly that the non tangential maximal function is bounded, and this is, you know, just from definitions by hardly little with maximal function with respect to the weight omega. So in principle, you could define hardly little with max. And then you would have harmonic measure, uh, sorry, non tangential maximal function of UNLP, just, you know, directly bounded by hardly little with max with um, weight omega. Again, I'm slightly cheating because there is this change of pole business and stuff, but morally speaking, that's the case. <laughs> And then the hardly little of max with respect to weight omega is bounded by uh, F in LP if the weight omega is well behaved, which is anything. So this is on sort of three of very you know, harmonic analysis basis. And again, the reality is slightly more difficult because you have to change poles and do it in scale and variant way, but that's the way you should be thinking about it. So non tangential max is basically the correct notion of how to be the max solutions provided omega is well behaved and way behaved is infinity. So that's why it's, these things are connected. And LP boundedness is LP solvability. And I didn't say what is Carlos's book, but everybody knows what's the Carlos's book, right? So CBMS lectures of 1994. Um, Another point that I want to make is that I will not explain the other sense, but I do keep saying, and I will keep saying that basically the fact that you can control square function by non conjunction maximum by the system, basically, the fact that you can control Carlison measure, all of this says that you can control oscillations of solutions. And the truth is that the absolute continuity of harmonic measure also tells you that you can't control oscillations of solutions because, of, well, it, it is continuous. You know, harmonic measure gives you representation and gives you solution for the data F. And if it's absolutely continuous, it means that, you know, from one cube to another, you not, have not changed too much. So somehow the connection between A infinity and square function and potential maximum function estimates. I, I have a little bit of you know, explanation here, but I'm not going to go there. Morally speaking, the connection is conforming oscillations of solutions. All of these are different iterations of the dots that you are controlling oscillations better and better and better as you come to them. Boundary in this very weak, but nonetheless appropriate form. So in order to prove a infinity of all poseness, so you name it, we need to be able to control square functions in terms of non tangential maps or directly prove the LP will pose. Um, I think I almost don't have time. Do I want to say anything before we... Um, I still have five minutes, right, Sasha, something like this. That, that, that a question. <laughs> One minute. Okay, it's forty-four. So we. But there are also a lot of difficult questions. Then. <laughs> um. All right. We'll start. We'll start from this point on the next lecture. I mean, I I won't actually play it again, but yeah, I see. I got a question. Well, it's any of this true, and this is sort of the question for them. Um. Next lecture, but the point is, we are going to be using the set to speak about. All of the sense. We're actually going to 